much, Adrian, and thank you for having me back uh, again. I think this is the fifth year in a row that I've been doing this, and it's always a pleasure to come in and talk, uh, you know, to the graduate students about about getting work funded. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start my screen share here. Hopefully, everyone, everybody just sees my slide, right? Not my slide and my notes. Good. Okay. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that I want to mention on there. So um, one of them is that, yeah, you're right. Our office did change our name very recently. So for many years, we were known as the Office of Proposal Development. Um, and there's a connotation there that what we did was focus entirely on just writing proposals and on developing grant proposals for faculty. And really what, what my office does is so much more than that, because there actually is so much more than just writing that goes into proposal development. Um, if you just sit down one day and start writing something, uh, your chances of being funded are very low, unless you do all the other background steps ahead of time to position yourself for success. Um, and so we changed our name just last fall, actually, to the Office of Research Development to better incorporate all the various different activities that we do. Um, kind of on that same note, one of the things I wanted to mention was that we talked about in, in the waiting room there that uh, this is the same presentation that I give to faculty members. So these concepts are broadly applicable regardless of what kind of proposal you're writing, whether it's a faculty proposal, whether it's a graduate student proposal, whether it's a business proposal. Um, my background is not in academics. Um, I actually make a point to say this every time I come and I talk to graduate students is that uh, I don't get introduced as Dr. Mitchell because I'm not Dr. Mitchell. Everything that I learned here, I actually didn't even learn in academia. I learned this working for the state of Florida, putting together grant proposals for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. So I say that because there is a mis uh, misperception sometimes that you have to have years and years of research experience, years of academic experience, that grant writing is a very difficult thing to do, um, that you have to just, it's so hard to do that it's not even worth it to get started, and that's simply not true. I got my first grant funded when I was 23. Uh, I had gra I graduated as an undergrad literally a year before I wrote that proposal, and I got funded, and it was a million dollars. Anybody can do this. You just have to invest the time to sit down and do it. Um, one of the best reasons I've ever heard to, as for why you should write a proposal, actually comes from FSU's former associate VP for research, Ross Ellington. Ross has always said that even if you don't want to, you should try to write a proposal because at the very least, it clarifies to you exactly what you want to do and why you want to do it. Uh, nothing helps focus your thinking more than trying to convince somebody else that you're right. And so what we're going to talk about today is both, um, there's both an art and a science to this. And I say that in the connotation of, of the common saying of art and science, right? So if something is a science, it's broadly applicable to a lot of different areas, um, and the concepts work across the board. But the art of it comes down to how you apply that to your very specific area. And so grant writing is very much both of those things. There is a science to it in that there are concepts that do apply across the board. But then there's also an art to it in how you apply those concepts to your specific area. And so when you write a proposal to the National Science Foundation, it is different than if you apply to the National Institutes of Health. It is different than if you apply to the Russell Sage Foundation or the, the MacArthur Foundation or the state of Florida. Each one of those things is a little bit different. And the best way to learn about the differences there is to talk to other people who have been funded by those entities and then also to talk to the people who are running those programs. So I always encourage people, reach out to colleagues, reach out to mentors, even, even cold calls to other, other uh, people who have been funded by an entity have, have been successful in the past. Try to find out what you can about the art of applying to a certain funding agency um, before you try to sit down and do it, because there are little nuances. And then the second part of that, too, is that if you ever do hear something in those conversations um, about the art of applying to one of those funding agencies that contradicts what I say here next, go with the art, not with what I say here, because it is more important to learn that little bit, the little difference uh, than it is to try to strictly apply right, the rules or the science of grant writing. Where's my next slide? 
So there's three, uh, three phases to funding success that we're going to talk about today. So the first is capture planning, the next is proposal planning, and then the final step is proposal development. Many people, when they sit down to do a grant, go immediately to number three, and that's a mistake. Investing time in numbers one and two here are really what set you up for success for number three. So capture planning. Capture planning is the process of identifying opportunities, assessing the competitive environment, and devising winning strategies oriented towards winning a specific funding opportunity. It is setting yourself up for success. This actually comes from the business world. Um, this is what a sales team does. A sales team goes out and finds leads and positions the company to have success when they eventually go to write a proposal, to submit a proposal for someone's business. Doing the same thing with research proposals is also critical. If you submit a proposal to uh, an organization that has never heard of you, your chances of success are much lower than if they know who you are, if they're familiar with your work, and if they're familiar with your history of success. So you can really think of capture planning as essentially doing your homework, um, trying to position yourself and learn as much as you can about, like I was saying a minute ago, the art of applying to that agency. What do they want uh, out of a proposal? What do they want out of a research project? What do they want out of an applicant? So some of the ways that you can identify funding opportunities uh, is the Pivot Funding Database. That's one that we always recommend. That is an online database that works uh, very much like any journal database that you're familiar with. Um, it is, uh, it's paid for by FSU and you have free access to it, but you have to use your at FSU email address um, or at my.fsu.edu uh, address works as well. Um, there are also, there are other ways to find funding. Um, you know, colleagues, are a great way, asking people that you know, hey, where did you get funded? Um, the strength of weak ties I always bring up too. If you just simply make it known to people within your network that you were looking for funding, other people may hear of things and forward them to you. Uh, that's actually a way that we find a lot of faculty find out about their funding. If someone subscribes to a listserv from a professional organization, gets a notification and forwards it to somebody else in their department who is interested in applying for that grant. Uh, agency newsletters, every single funding agency out there, every nonprofit, every local and state government has some sort of a newsletter that they put out periodically. Uh, if you identify that place as a likely source of funding for you and you sign up for their newsletter, I guarantee you they will let you know when they have funding opportunities. And then finally, the last one that I bring up that people sometimes laugh at is, is Google. If you just go to Google and search funding opportunities for and type in your research project, you'll find something. That's actually how I found my funding. I just went to Google and searched funding opportunities for renewable energy and energy efficiency. And it popped up with a whole host of opportunities. Um, so you don't necessarily have to use any of these specialized tools. You don't have to go and do a, a years long search or spend hours and hours and hours doing this. Just simply setting up quick uh, alerts through agency newsletters. You can set up alerts through Pivot and then just you know, make it a habit once a week to go Google for funding opportunities uh, related to your area and, and you'll, you'll find things. So you also have to understand what a funding agency wants out of a funding opportunity. And think about, think about why does, why would someone put a funding opportunity out there? In the vast majority of cases, funding opportunities do not exist for you. And that's really important to understand. The goal of that agency or that foundation is not to make you successful. It is to achieve some goal that they have set for themselves or to achieve some kind of a goal that the, the taxpayers of the United States have set for them. And they need you to do it for them. So they're not necessarily investing in your success or any altruistic reasons because they want to enable you to be successful. Uh, it's because they have some broader goal that they need to have achieved and they need you to do it. And so I say that because that is a common misconception when people write proposals is they focus it on them. They focus too much on what would the funding mean to me? What would the results of this project mean to me and to my career and to enable future research? When really what you need to focus on is how can I help you, the funding agency, achieve your mission? And the only way that you can convince them of that is to understand what their mission is in the first place. So in order to do that, you know, some of the best ways are to just simply go to their website, 
go to the website of whatever funding agency or foundation it is you want to apply for, understand who they are, you know, read their about us page, their priorities, their, their history is always a great indication of where they invested in the past, uh, what kind of projects are they interested in, uh, why were they founded in some cases, if they're a, a, a private foundation is really important. Uh, also really important is strategic or annual reports. A lot of times funding agencies will identify in a multi-year strategic plan what kind of things they want to focus on over the next five years. And if you can tie your project to one of the goals that they identify there, you're going to give yourself a huge advantage. Um, if you go a little bit deeper, you can look at speeches or presentations by top officials. So if the, the NSF director talks about a uh, funding in, in AI research over the next five years in a speech to Congress, right? You can then know that NSF is interested in AI. Similarly, if you find a, a presentation to a board of directors from a foundation, executive director, where they talk about a funding priority, that's another clear indication of where they are trying to, uh, how they're trying to connect their funding interests to their overall mission. Uh, another way is to look at previous awards and awardees. So see what else have they funded and how is your research related? A lot of places will publish a, uh, a list of who they have funded, the title of the award, and in a lot of cases, a summary of the award. And you can go ahead and look and see, um, see where similar projects have gone in the past. So a really great example of this is just very recently, I was working with a professor to, uh, to put together a proposal to the NSF career program. And he didn't know where to submit it. Uh, he worked on a uh, he worked on sea level rise, and sea level rise could go to a variety of different programs within NSF. And the way that we helped narrow down which ones to target was by putting into NSF's uh, awards database sea level rise and seeing what other directorates had funded it. Uh, and it actually came up with a directorate that neither one of us would have thought of in the first place, uh, and that's where he's going to end up submitting. So. That's a, a clear way of, of figuring out where is your research or your project going to be a best fit. Uh, and then the obvious one that I think people may, uh, may overlook a lot, the absolute best place to find out what the priority of the funding agency is and what the priority of the funding opportunity itself is, is the funding opportunity. Every single funding opportunity document, whether it's a request for proposal, a funding opportunity announcement, a uh, notice of funding availability, whatever you want to call it, whatever, whatever alphabet soup acronym the agency wants to assign to it, the document that describes the funding competition is going to tell you why the funding competition exists. You have to read that document. You have to understand why they're trying to do something. And then finally, building a relationship with program officers uh, is really key too, because they can give you insights beyond just the funding opportunity and beyond all of these other resources. So if you go and get an opportunity to talk to a program officer, they may tell you things uh, kind of off the record sometimes or uh, allow you to read between the lines to really find out how good of a fit your project is for their particular program. And not just how good a fit it is, but how competitive it is compared to other, uh, other likely applicants. So why bother with this? This is all capture planning. This is all stuff that's it's probably new to, to many of you um, and that you would not necessarily have thought of. It, the reason why you want to do capture planning is to improve your position with the person who is going to fund you and make it more likely to be funded. So literally in the business terms here, you can see at the bottom of the screen, the goal of capture planning is to improve a seller's position, right? You're the seller selling your research uh, with buyers, buyers being funding agencies therefore making it more likely that your proposal is to be funded. And so there's four positions there you can see in that graphic. So you can go from an unknown position where you just simply find an opportunity and submit a proposal. And that's it. You have no idea how the agency feels about you uh, or what their research is. You just know that it met some keywords and you sent something in. Uh, you can go to a known position though, if you find out some of these details where you can align your goals with, with what the funding agency's goals are and then connect with their agencies, lets you know a little bit more about what's going on. Uh, and then ultimately lets you move to an improved or even a favored position where you are understanding who else is likely to apply and you can enhance your proposal to, to, to um, minimize your weaknesses compared to other competitors and maximize your strengths. 
And finally, if, if you ever do get to this point, you can be in a favored position where you've built a long-term relationship with that agency, and they are actually developing funding opportunities in such a way that makes you um, preferred to applying to it. So this is one of those things where if you, if you get on a panel um, at a funding agency and they know who you are, they know what kind of research you do, and they know what kind of projects you do, um, they may actually tailor an RFP such that you are one of a handful of people who are even qualified to, uh, to fulfill it. And that is, that's a long-term goal down the road, but it is, if you can get to that point by going through this process over time, you'll start just raking in the money left and right. So proposal planning then. So you've, you've gone from capture planning where you've identified what the funding, or the funding agency wants, you started to align your overall research goals, and now you wanna move into the idea of, uh, I found the funding opportunity, I'm ready to start writing, but I'm going to plan out what I'm going to write. I'm not just going to sit down one day and start, start at it. The absolute first thing you have to do is you have to read the request for proposal. I can't emphasize that enough. Read the request for proposal and read it again. Read every single word. You would be surprised the number of times I have seen a proposal come in. Someone has asked me, hey, can you help me edit this proposal? It's due in three or four days. And I go read the RFP and find out that they're missing a key section. And then I ask them, why don't you have this? Well, I didn't know it was there. Right, you all are students. Have you ever sat down on the first day of class and not read the syllabus? It's the same thing. It's the same idea. Uh, what I like to do then is, is not just read it, but also do what I call shredding it, where you go line by line through this document and you make a checklist of each of those requirements. Every time there is something in there that says uh, shall, will, must, should, that's its own checklist item so that you know to address that requirement somehow within your proposal. That is the absolute best way to ensure that you address every single thing that the, the agency wants. And so you don't run into a situation where you're coming down to the last two or three days and having a surprise requirement. Once you've identified in that last task, uh, right, you've shredded the RFP, you know all the various requirements. What you want to do is convert that checklist into a, uh, a task list. So if you know that one of the requirements is that you have to write a section about project management plan, or you have to write a section about research methodology, or you have to write a section about your qualifications, you want to make that a task and schedule when throughout this process you're going to do it so that you stay on top of things, right? So that you don't sit down one night and have to suddenly write the entire 15-page proposal all at once. Um, and you want to work around hard deadlines as much as you possibly can, right? So if you know it's due on the 30th of the month, right, that's your first day, and you have to start working backwards from there. So, right, at FSU, if you submit a proposal through sponsored research, it's due to sponsored research three days prior to the agency deadline. So if it's due on the 30th, we know it's due to SRA on the 27th. And then from there, you start working backwards. It's gonna take me three days to write a section on this, schedule out three days. It's gonna take another three days to do this, schedule it out like this. And that just helps you to, to maintain progress and to know when are you going to do things and when do you have to have certain inputs done. Um, I also really recommend everybody be realistic about those estimates. You want to overestimate the amount of time that you're going to spend on these things and be pleasantly surprised if you come in quicker rather than underestimating and being slammed with work. Um, especially because, at least in most cases here, this is not your primary job. Uh, you know, grant writing is a thing that you were doing in addition to everything else that you have to do. And so finding time to make sure that it fits into your schedule is really critical. Don't plan on working over weekends, holidays, anything like that, at least at first. You want to make sure that you, if you need three days to do something and one of those three days falls on a holiday, skip that holiday and go one day further. That way, if worse comes to worse, you can, you can work on that day, but it's a little bit of buffer time uh, that you didn't necessarily have to uh, account for. And you also want to plan some time in there for reviews and feedback. So if you want someone else to read your work, which I highly recommend uh, having, having done, 
you need to give that person not only enough time for them to read it and comment on it, but also enough time for you to make changes um, based upon that feedback. So I'll give you a good example of that. Right now I'm working on a big proposal to the MacArthur Foundation where we're doing this. We have two rounds of external reviews. Even though the proposal is not due until the end of August, we actually had our entire first draft done in the middle of July so that we could have external reviewers take a look at it and still have six weeks to go back and make changes. Um, that is really, really important. Having all of this time is critical to decreasing the stress and anxiety that is going to be a part of this process. It's going to make it just, it's going to make it more pleasant for you to do. And the better of an experience this is, the better the proposal is going to be. If you are stressed and rushed in writing it, it's going to come across in your writing and it's not going to be as effective of a proposal. And it also just, it increases your ability to ask for help. Like I said, if you run into a problem a day before it's due, you can't ask anybody. But if you run into that same problem three weeks before it's due, you have three weeks to figure out what to do about it. You also want to identify uh, what are called features, benefits, and themes. These are how you're going to structure the writing of your proposal. You're going to uh, write your, your various sentences, your various points around, around this idea. So a feature is something that is a, an aspect of your proposal, right? So it's something like the methodology, the research direction. It's a, a thing that you are trying to do. But a benefit is the way in which your feature solves a problem that the buyer cares about. So let's just say, for example, if you uh, say you specialize in a mixed methods approach research, that's a feature of your research. Whoever is funding your work does not care that you specialize in mixed methods research. What they care about is solving the opioid crisis and your mixed methods research can help them do that. So a theme statement in a proposal then connect your feature with the funder's benefit. And that's really what you want to do. You want to make sure that the thing that you are selling is something that they are buying and tell them why it is. And then if, you, if you're getting really good at this and you know a lot about your competitors, you can also go into what are called discriminators, uh, which are features that you have that nobody else has. And that lets the agency know uh, it, it helps like discriminate your proposal from the rest of the field uh, and will give you a, a better competitive advantage. So like I said, funders buy benefits. They do not buy features. This is a really, really common mistake that I see in proposals where people focus on the thing that they do, not on how the thing that they do helps the funding agency. I also, this is just the best practice that I recommend uh, drafting a proposal outline and some, and some content ahead of time. This is, perhaps this is me just personally. I don't like to sit down with a blank page and start and just end up 15 pages or 25 pages, whatever it is later. I like to have a, an idea of what kind of sections I'm going to have in there and start uh, putting in content ahead of time and, and fleshing the proposal out uh, that way. So, if an agency or an RFP specifies or suggests an outline, you must follow that outline. Um, even if it is just a suggestion or a recommendation, or even, uh, even if they specifically say it is optional, it is not optional. If they give you a format, you have to follow their format. Um, because reviewers will be looking for that format. And even if it's not necessarily going to get you thrown out because you didn't follow it, it's going to make it more difficult on the reviewer to read the proposal if it's not in the same format that everybody else uh, submitted it in, or it's not in the same format that they are familiar with. If there is no outline specified, the best thing to do is try to find an example of a successful proposal from somebody else and follow what they did. Uh, if you can't do that, what I'd recommend doing is following what's called Heilmeier's Catechism. Uh, Heilmeier, George Heilmeier was the director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, agency in the Department of Defense um, in the 70s. And he uh, specified these six questions that all proposals must answer. So if you have nowhere else to start, I would start with these six questions in this order.
You'll also see if you look at these six questions and then you look at examples of RFPs, you will see how these questions are incorporated in different terms, in different words, into what the other agencies are asking for. Every proposal in the world ever is going to ask you, what are you trying to do? Right? Every, everybody's going to ask, what is currently done and why is that not good enough? What is new about your approach and why is it going to be successful? Who cares? What difference is this going to make? What are the risks? And then what are the checks for success? Every single RFP is going to ask those questions, even if they use different terms. I'll tell you the most important questions on here. What are you trying to do? That is the key question. Uh, I'll get more into this in a second, but if you don't answer what are you trying to do almost immediately, your chances of success go way down. The second most important question is who cares and what difference is this going to make? What is the significance of what you're trying to do and what is going to be different after you are done? So again, why bother with this? Because uh, I have a feeling most of you came today to hear what I'm going to talk about next, not what I just talked about for the last half an hour. Proposal planning saves you time and it saves you effort, and it really increases the quality of your proposal. It is critical for any time you're going to work on collaborative or team projects. If you're going to work with somebody else, there has to be a plan so that you know who is doing what when and that things don't slip through the cracks. Uh, I am an absolutely strong proponent that this nothing is more important to improving the quality of the proposal than having a good plan for how you're going to do it and sticking to that plan. So the final stage here, proposal development. This is the part that everybody thinks of as proposal writing. The first thing you want to do when you sit down and you start to write is you want to ita bold, italicize, or underline key points. So I've got an example of this up here on the left side of the screen. If you, uh, if you take a look at it, what are the first things you see besides the graphic? Your eye is probably drawn mostly to the bolded statement there in the middle of the page, the proposed work aims to understand the dynamic structure of property, right? Like what is that's good. Yeah, or yeah, on the edge. exactly. Um, so it draws the reader in and it gives them an idea of what is going to be on that page so they know what to expect. That's really important because it frames the proposal before they even start to write it. Um, people in general tend to remember best the first thing they read and the last thing they read. All right, and that goes back to, right, we've always heard first impressions are really important. It is no different with proposals. Um, when reviewers read proposals, they form an opinion of whether or not they want to fund that proposal within the first 75% of the first page. Um, if they can't tell by the end of that first page what you're trying to do, you're likely not going to be funded. And they are going to spend the rest of that proposal justifying that first impression. If they don't decide right up front to fund you, your chances of convincing them otherwise in the subsequent pages is very, very low. And so you, one of the ways that you can do that is by, by doing this, by bolding and italicizing underlying key points so that when they first open it up and they read exactly what you're going to do, they frame within their mind everything else about that page within the context of this is the goal of the proposal. Right, another example of this here on the next page, uh, this is an example where the PI has chosen to uh, bold and italicize a key point rather than um, their what are they trying to do statement, right? So this was for a, a center at, uh, at FAMU, actually, where they were applying for an NSF HBCU-related program. So the, the key point that they chose to bold and italicize was, as a result of the command center, we expect to produce 15 to 20 African-American PhDs because they identified within the RFP that that was a thing that uh, the funding opportunity was really concerned about, increasing representation among uh, engineering PhD students. And so they chose to emphasize how their proposal would do exactly that. There's another thing on this slide too that I always like to mention. Take a look at the name of the proposal. It's the CREST Center for Complex Materials Design for Multidimensional Additive Processing. Now, if you, if you were a reviewer and somebody sent that to you and you read the title of the proposal as the Center for Complex Materials Design for Multidimensional Additive Processing, do you think you would remember that? 25 proposals later, you, you likely would not remember the title of this proposal. 
However, I guarantee that everybody remembered the title, the command center. Having that memorable, that hook in the title of the proposal helps the reviewers at the end of the day when they come back and, and make the recommendations for which one to fund. Because reviewers are very, very rarely reading just your proposal. They're likely reading many proposals. In the case of some panels uh, that I've heard of at NSF, they can read anywhere between 25 and 50 proposals. And so you need to stand out in some way and make sure that if they read your proposal today and they go back to make the rating tomorrow or they go back to make the to have the discussion about the relative uh, where your proposal ranks in competition to other ones, you want them to remember you. Um, and one of the best ways you can do it is by having a catchy title. Uh, just sorry, I really harp on this point. You do not have to have your proposal title sound like their academic journal title. That is something that I see a lot of and it always drives me crazy. You wanna make sure that you present your ideas as simply as possible. This is one of those, if you've ever heard the idea that the newspaper is written to an eighth grade reading level, it's kind of the same concept here. The people who read your proposal are not going to be specialists in your area. In fact, they're going to expect that really only you are the foremost expert in whatever this topic is that you're talking about. And so you need to make sure that you write your proposal in a way that is accessible to people from many different backgrounds. So it's not necessarily to the level of, uh, of eighth grade reading level like the newspaper is, but you can pretty much always guarantee that anybody who reads your proposal is at least gonna have a bachelor's degree in whatever area of study you focus in. Uh, you don't wanna use big words right, big words and quotes here, um, things that needlessly complicate the point you were trying to make. So an example of that, uh, one of my favorites is this project will elucidate the theory of science, right? Uh, elucidate is, it's kind of a big word, right? The first time I read it, I had to open up the dictionary and figure out what that meant. Um, it just means to look at, to explore, to shed light upon. Uh, the phrase, this project will explore the theory of science is just inherently easier to understand because explore is a more common word than elucidate. Um, similarly here, the education activity in this proposal will allow students to experience visual impressions of a working lab. That is an example from a real proposal that I read. Experience visual impressions of a working lab just means look at. We will invite students into our lab and they will get to look at it. Uh, at the present moment in time, we would like to call attention to the fact that, that there's just too much there that is needlessly complicated. You just need to say, say exactly what you're trying to say and don't, don't add anything else um, unnecessarily to it. And then finally, this is one of my favorite examples too, more specifically. I see this all the time. You, can, you can't be more specific. Just be specific in the first place. There's no need to go further with it. Um, and all of these are, again, going back to the idea of if you make the reviewer think about anything other than exactly the point that you were trying to make, you decrease the chances that they're going to really remember the thing that you were trying to get them to remember and that they're going to instead think about all of these other aspects. Uh, and then, of course, always want to define any acronyms on first use. Um, and then I like to periodically remind the, re the reviewer throughout the proposal, what does that acronym stand for, especially if it's a, a non-standard acronym or if it's something that uh, there is a similar acronym that is more familiar to people. So, so a, an example of that, right, um, ATM. ATM can mean either uh, asynchronous transfer mode or it can mean automated teller machine. Everybody knows the second, but not many people know the first. And if you say ATM throughout your entire proposal and don't define it and don't remind people what you're talking about here, there's a there's an easy tendency to uh, lose sight of exactly what you're doing. So really similar to this, is the idea of avoiding grandiose language. So really big statements that are, are hard to support and really are, are very subjectively applied. Um, instead, what you wanna do is be as specific as possible about the expected outcomes from your proposal. So 
A couple of examples of this here. The proposed project will revolutionize the field of science. Right, your definition of revolutionize may be different than a, a reviewer's. It may be different than, than someone else's. Instead, what you need to do is be very specific about how are you going to revolutionize the field of science? How are you going to change it? Uh, sim very, very similar. The proposed research represents a total paradigm shift. That's a big statement. If you're, if you're proposing that what you're going to do is radically shift the, the way that an entire field thinks about something, you better be able to back that up somehow. Um, so either, right, if you can back it up, awesome, and absolutely do it. If you feel that you are going to, if your work really is going to result in a total paradigm shift, then great, go for it. But tell us how. You have to tell us how. Because if you don't tell us how, people are going to look at that and kind of roll their eyes. Uh, another, another way this can present itself is, uh, is like this example. This research will solve climate change and end world hunger. Those are massive, massive, massive problems. Um, and it is very unlikely that your, your one project alone is going to be the thing that solves one of these big problems. And so instead you want to be more specific about, right, if you're addressing this overall big concept specifically to your project, what is the expected outcome? that contributes to the solving of that project. Um, another really, really important one that I always say that people don't think about is in relation to the budget and re in relation to the amount of money that they are going to request. So we'll often see proposals that say something to the effect of, with this single $100,000 grant, I will do, and then they list off a bunch of tasks that would actually require a million dollars to do instead. So. And I'll, I'll come back to this in a few minutes here when we talk about how to do a budget, but you want to be really specific about if you propose to do a task, the resources that you assign to that task have to be realistic to accomplish it. Um, don't try to make it seem as if you were going to deliver a million dollars worth of results with $100,000. Avoid run-on sentences. This is this is pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory and applies in writing of all kinds, but each sentence should present a single idea and be as clear as possible. So just, just one example of this, and this actually comes from a real proposal that I've read. Uh, acquaintance with ongoing research projects at FSU related to electric shift technology, superconducting power systems, cryogenic systems, as well as the development efforts in collaboration with many Navy contractors provide opportunities for the students in the program to connect their individual research efforts to powerful future superconducting shift technologies and prepare them for future engineering careers in these fields, which are rapidly expanding due to the needs of a 21st century Navy, which is faced with evolving geopolitical threats. That is one sentence. Uh, and with apologies to the folks at the Center for Advanced Power Systems, who uh, I took that from. But that was one sentence in, in a real proposal that started off talking about ongoing research projects at FSU and ended up talking about uh, expanding geopolitical threats to the Navy in the 21st century. Instead, what you need to do is you need to break that up into multiple smaller sections that are much easier and clearer to understand and communicate only one point at one time. Many of these things that we're talking about here in these slides are really ways to help reduce the overall uh, cognitive burden on reviewers. The idea there being you don't want them to think about anything other than what you want them to think about. If you are making them read a sentence like this, their eyes will glaze over. They will lose focus. They will not be paying attention anymore to the point that you were trying to make. And it doesn't matter how great your idea is, if you were doing some of these things that, that makes reviewers lose focus on how great your idea is, you're still not going to get funded. Really similar to run-on sentences are walls of text. Um, what I mean by a wall of text is there on the left. When you open up a page and it is nothing but 100 lines of of words with no breaks, nothing in between. And again, it is really, really easy to get lost in that, to lose focus on what you're reading and to not remember the key points that the person was trying to make in that proposal. Instead, what you wanna do is break it up into smaller sections like I've done on the right. So this is actually from one of my proposals. Um, I took the example on the right, which is what I actually did, and removed all the section headings, all the paragraph spaces, 
and all of the, uh, the list, bullet point list, and resulted in this. And that shows what you can do is you can take this exact text that you have written here, and if you just format it differently, it makes it easier to understand what's going on. So, right, yeah, it may be a bit small for everyone to see here, but on the right, we have a project background, we have project objectives, we have objectives one, two, and three, and then we have project methods with uh, tasks one, two, and three. It's much easier to see the connection between the overall concept, the specific goals to achieve that concept, and then the specific tasks to achieve those goals to achieve the objective of the project. It's, just, it's, it's easier to see and easier to understand. You also want to be absolutely as specific as possible, and you do not want to leave any room for interpretation because what somebody else thinks you mean might not have been what you actually meant. Um, this goes to the idea of you want reviewers, again, to think only what you want them to think. You do not want them to fill in the blanks ever. So just a couple of examples here of how this gets applied. Um, Based upon this prior research, the next step is obvious. Well, it might be obvious to you, but it's not necessarily obvious to the reviewer, and what they fill in might not be the same thing as what you intended to fill in. So you can address that by simply saying instead, based on this prior research, the next step is, and then you state the next step. Once process A has been completed, we will then begin work on process C, and fill in the blanks there with whatever your, your methodology is. But you've you've done something where you've clearly implied that you will do something between A and C, but you haven't stated it. Again, they may think then that that means that you don't know what you're doing. If you didn't say you're gonna do this really critical step in between there, they may think that it's because you don't know that it needs to be done. So again, just be specific. Once process A is complete, we will begin process B, which leads into process C. Uh, the results of process A are shown in table one. Okay, well, what? What you see in table one and what you interpret table one to say may not be exactly what I interpret table one to say. It may not be what a reviewer at a funding agency may uh, interpret your results to mean. And so what you wanna do is say, again, results of process A are shown in table one. These results mean. We'll get more into this in a second when we talk about captions. Uh, we expect our work to yield important results, such as, Right, what important results? Uh, don't let the reviewer interpret what those results are. Tell them exactly what you feel the important results are and let them either agree or disagree. Uh, and then finally, we will work with our partners to complete this project. That is another one of my favorite phrases in proposals because the phrase work with means absolutely nothing until you tell me what it means. Right, right now I'm working with all of you. I'm working with you to, to learn about um, proposals. Right, this definition of work with is very different than the definition of work with in a, a research collaboration context where you're going to be doing tasks. So to address this, you just gotta be really specific. We're gonna work with our partners to complete the project. We're gonna do A, they're gonna do B, and then this other person is gonna do C. Really spell it out and be as specific as possible. One of the things that I that people hear a lot when it comes to writing proposals is that you have to use graphics. This is like a, a, a truism in the grant writing field. You gotta put pictures in there, you gotta put in graphics, you gotta put in some kind of figures. Everybody says it and very rarely do people explain why. Why do you need to put a graphic in there? And how do you use graphics appropriately? Graphics draw readers' attention. When you open a page and there's a graphic on it, the first thing you will do is look at that graphic. The second thing you will do is look at the caption of that graphic. That frames the rest of that page forever after. After you've seen that and after you've read that caption, that is what you're thinking about for the rest of that page. So you really want to use that wisely. The graphics have also been shown to, uh, to increase retention. So if you see something in a graphic and you read a caption, it's been shown that you remember better what you saw there. And so that's really important, again, when we talk about how 
reviewers are going to compare your proposal to other proposals later on. So there's a couple of examples here on this page of, of different kinds of graphics and the appropriate circumstances in which to use them. So a chart can show a relationship or a flow between ideas. Um, a graph shows data correlations, trends, comparisons. Photos, and this is really important because people put photos in proposals for all the wrong reasons. For photos, if you use a photo in a proposal, the only reason to do so is if you want to prove that something exists or that something has happened in the past. So what I mean by that is, is really here on the next page. Don't use graphics just for the sake of using graphics. Uh, these are two photos. If you're writing a proposal about the impacts of the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, there is zero need to put a picture of a beach and label it the Gulf of Mexico. That doesn't do you absolutely any good. Um, very similarly, if you're writing a proposal that talks about uh, the effects of uh, aerodynamics on advanced aeronautical applications, you do not need to put a picture of advanced aeronautical applications like this. Um, this was an example actually on the right there from a real proposal. Someone was writing something about how uh, they were going to create a new kind of material that can be used in the Air Force's F-35 fighter jet. I guarantee you the Air Force knows what the F-35 looks like and they know that it exists. Uh, you don't have to show them a photo. Um, where you could provide value with photos is if something along the lines of you were doing an educational and outreach activity and you want to show that you have done it before. If you put a picture of you doing that activity before, it is it, you have absolutely proven, yes, you have done it and nobody can deny it. Um, if you want to say we have built a prototype of whatever our device is and you show a photo of that prototype, yes, there it is. Uh, and the reviewers can get a lot of confidence that you actually do know what you're doing and that you actually have experience doing these things if you show them a photo of whatever it is. But in almost every other circumstance, there's no reason to show photos. A really key point on graphics, though, that gets missed a lot is the importance of the caption that goes with the graphic. So just showing the graphic is only half of it. The other half is interpreting that graphic through the caption. So I'm going to say that again. The graphic draws in the attention, but the caption tells them what you want them to think. So captions interpret the visual and then provide the connection between the features and the benefits, going all the way back to where we talked about theme statements, where funding agencies buy benefits, they don't buy features. Captions here make that connection between the feature and the benefit and should almost always be theme statements in some form. So just as an example here, this is a, a process of, um, this was a, an experimental process in a proposal that showed how they were going to go through various steps. And if the label is just, just this, the proposed co-curing layout procedure, okay, you told me what that is, but you haven't told me why it's there. And the why it's there is more important. So if you were to simply change that same caption to say not just what is happening, but also why, uh, it's going to be much stronger. So if you just add the, this result in a stronger yet lighter structural components for use in advanced aeronautical applications, you've now told the reviewer why you think this process is important. And so now as they read the rest of that text, they're going to be keeping in mind this process that they have just shown me is important for achieving this benefit that I am trying to achieve through this funding program. This is also super, super important on uh, graphs and any data. Going back to that reason of um, you have to be specific about what you want them to take away from it because your interpretation of data may be different than their interpretation of data. So just for example here, this is a label at the top, right? This just shows this is the coefficient of thermal expansion. Okay, thank you. I, that's that's what it is, I, I get it. But a caption goes beyond that and says, this is the coefficient of thermal expansion. Materials with low coefficients of thermal expansion are necessary to enable next generation supersonic aircraft. That's important. That's what they're trying to get out of this proposal. Whoever, whoever this funding agency was, um, probably the Air Force, 
was looking to enable next generation supersonic aircraft. And now you have told them how the results that you just showed there indicate that you can achieve that benefit that they are trying to get. Really want to make sure that you have a clear uh, and understandable structure to the proposal. Going back and, and tying this to the walls of text, this is really important. You want to emphasize the future, not the past. A lot of academic writing emphasizes the past first as a way to build up to what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so an example of that there is on the left, just the relative proportions of literature review to problem statements. What you want to do is invert that in a, in a grant proposal. Say up front, your proposed project is going to add to the field of whatever it is, and that is the first sentence that you're, you're adding. Um, then you want to tell them why that advancement is important. So, right, we're putting what are we doing and why is it important are the first two things in a proposal, and then it's followed by all the various things that happened before that led to us needing to do those two or leading us to need to do this project. And again, this is, I can't say this enough, people remember best the first thing they read and the last thing they read. And so you want the first thing that they read to be what you're doing and why it's important. You also want to try to write specifically to review criteria as much as possible. If you know that reviewers are going to be looking for certain things and it's almost always in an RFP what the evaluation criteria is, you want to write sentences that specifically say how your, uh, how your work ties to the evaluation criteria. This is really the same thing as those theme statements again, right? How do your features connect to the benefits? How does your work connect to the evaluation criteria? It's the same idea. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of this. These are from uh, a program that my office runs for first year assistant professors. This is literally what the evaluation criteria for that program is. The reviewers are asked, is the project or is the, uh, yeah, is the project or the issue that the project will address important or significant in the PI's area of research? You, will, you could say in your proposal, my topic is an important area of research in my field because that way, when a reviewer reads your proposal and they see that statement, they know the answer to that question that they are being asked, and they can just copy and paste it and put it in. It makes it really easy on them, and it really makes the only thing that they have to think about whether or not they agree with you that that about the importance of that statement. Not that they don't have to wonder what it is or what you're trying to do. They just need to know. Um, they need to make their evaluation of it. You know, again, are the research methods and or creative activities appropriate in light of the goals of the project? The proposed methodology was selected because, tell them exactly how you feel that the methodology is connected to uh, the goals and objectives. And these methods are appropriate for those goals and objectives because, right, we're writing specifically to the questions that the reviewers are being asked. A few more examples, is the project clearly related to the PI's long-term research goals, right? You would respond to that by saying the PI's long-term research goals are, tell them what your, your goals are and then say how your proposed project helps to fulfill those goals. Um, one, of the, one of the requirements for this program is uh, an explanation of the differentiation between uh, a new assistant professor's dissertation research and this new line, this new project they are doing. So, in this example, right, you could say this proposal represents a, sub a substantive departure from my dissertation by, and then say how it is. This is important uh, for a lot of different applications, right? Um, many times an agency will ask you, what have you done with prior funding from us? I know NSF, for example, always asks this, results from prior NSF support. If you have two projects that have very similar titles and are doing very similar things, you need to differentiate them somehow. And the clearest way to do that is to say, my prior work did X and my new work will do Y, or my new work will do Y plus one. Last couple of slides here. Budget. Budget is part of your proposal as well. It is, it is not just all about this narrative section. The key point with a budget is to ask for exactly what you need. Not more, not less, exactly what you need to do the work. 
if you pad the budget with extra expenses, reviewers will call you on it and say that you're wasting their money. If you ask for too little, reviewers will question whether or not you're going to have enough resources to be able to do your goals. Remember that reviewers are people like you, right? It's called peer review for a reason. Um, they have done projects similar to this, and they know how much it costs. If you go over or under, they're going to know, and they're going to call you on it. Make sure that you budget for everything in the proposal. If you propose to do a task, there needs to be some explanation of where you are getting the resources to do that task, whether it is in the budget as a line item or if it's going to be done for free or as a part of some other project that you were doing, you need to specify that so that they don't ask, how are they going to be able to do this if they don't have any money to do it? This is really, really common. Um, and it goes back again to that idea of making sure that we're very specific about the things that we're going to do and how we're going to do them. If you infer or imply rather that there is a, a step within that process, um, but you don't talk about it and you don't talk about the resources that you're going to use to do it, they will ask whether or not it really is realistic that you can accomplish the goals. Uh, there are people who work in every academic department on this campus and on, I will say, 95% of other university campuses across the country. And certainly if you go work in a government agency or a, a, a nonprofit agency or a, a business, there are people there who specialize specifically in financial management and budget development. Every, every place has this. Work with them, develop this. Don't try to do this on your own. Um, go to them and tell them, here are the tasks that I want to do. Here are the general ideas of the things that I want to spend money on and ask them for help to come up with the specific dollar amount for how much those things cost. A proposal also is not just that one, that narrative section. It is not just about writing down your ideas and submitting it. There's a lot of other things that go into a complete proposal, a complete grant application, besides just the project narrative. And you really got to think about those things because they're going to take longer than you think to do. And if you don't do them or if you don't do them correctly, you will get thrown out before anybody even reads your proposal and then you have wasted all that effort for nothing. Um, things like bio sketches or CVs, letters of support, equipment and facilities descriptions, data management plans, postdoc mentoring plans, anything along these lines, these are all attachments. They get attached onto that narrative section that you wrote. And if they're not there, like I said, you will not be reviewed. It doesn't matter how good your idea is. It doesn't matter, you know, how long you spent on this. It's going to be thrown out before it's even reviewed. I say this, and I, I cannot emphasize this enough. You, if it is in the RFP, it has to be in the proposal. This has happened many times. This has happened to me. This has happened recently um, to me. You have to be very, 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 very deliberate to make sure that everything gets in there and you cannot wait until the last minute and focus all of your efforts on writing the proposal and not thinking about the other aspects of a complete grant application. I'd also encourage you to, when you develop your proposal planning uh, planning process, to include these as steps within that process, right? Secure CVs for project team. Get letters of support and, and schedule them out the same way you're scheduling out the actual writing of the proposal. And so with that, that is uh, my presentation. Thank you all for bearing with me and my internet. Um, I have plenty of time to answer questions. Uh, Adrian, if you want to moderate that or however. Yes, sure. That's not a problem. If you can um, stop your share and then we can have a view of all of, of our participants. So first of all, I want to thank you, Mike, for your very informative uh, presentation um, and facilitation of information that's going to be pretty useful um, for everyone in this meeting that is interested in developing a proposal um, for fellowships and awards, but also to support their thesis, their dissertation, and other types of writing projects that they have. So I want to say thank you. You're getting all the thank yous in the chat uh, right now. Um, yes. so there are a couple of questions that were posed to me privately. So I want to, there's some people that are shy, so I'm going to ask them on their behalf. And the first question was related to 
Are graphics absolutely necessary for any proposal, including in the humanities? This person is a PhD student in philosophy, um, and a lot of their research wouldn't seem to require or benefit from graphics. So they want to know if, if it's something that they have to do. No, you do not have to have graphics. Um, it is a best practice, and if there is a way that you can incorporate graphics, um, that's great, and it can add to a proposal, but it is not a 100% requirement that you have to do it. And I'd also say it's better to not have a graphic than to force a graphic. Don't put one in just for the sake of putting a graphic in. If there's not something that you can clearly tie between that graphic and a benefit or a, a point that you were trying to make, you don't need to put it in. Um, another thing, Mike, um, as a follow-up to what you mentioned about um, the budget and some of the other moving parts of applications and proposals that uh, persons need to consider when putting their materials together, one of the things that I wanted to mention that not many people are aware of is that we have grant administrators here at FSU mm -hmm. that are assigned to departments. They're assigned to departments, and some of them are embedded in departments. And those um, grant administrators are a resource to graduate students. So if you are putting together a proposal, especially if it's a um, federally funded proposal, then there are grant administrators that can help you with all of the moving parts of those proposals. They're very familiar with um, those funding mechanisms. So especially NIH, NSF, and a few of the other federally funded awards. So when I send a follow-up e email, I will put um, a link to the list of grant administrators so that you can identify the grant administrator for your department. Um, and if there's not one for your department, there will be a general number that you can contact to identify the person that would work with you specifically. So I just wanted to, to follow up and mention that. You all can take your videos off and or your mute if you have a question. Um, and, and ask your questions away. Uh, I do have a question. This is Amanda speaking. I don't know if I'm coming up as a black box. <laughs> um, I, I think early on you suggest that we build relationships with program officers. And so I'm wondering, how do you advise that we navigate that relationship? Uh, what should we ask um, uh, to make sure also first so that we get a response um, from that person that is an excellent question that is an excellent question um what i would recommend the best way to go about this is first off find a reason to talk to them um find a question that you can ask that is not answered by the rfp and is not answered by um their project website or something like that if you can find a way to say hey i had a question about this i have looked everywhere else and i can't find it um, can you answer it for me? That's a great way to just break the ice and, and talk to them, find a reason to talk to them. The other way is if you are going to apply to their program, if you think that you might apply to their program rather, write a half a page or a one page description of your research of what it is that you want to do and just send it to them. Email it to them and say, I've, I'm a graduate student at FSU or I'm a professor at wherever. Um, this is the work that I want to do. I saw your program and I thought that it might be a good fit. Can you tell me if you agree, would this project be a good fit for your program and would it be competitive within your program? And just leave it at that. And they'll respond to you. I guarantee they will respond to you. I mean, it's their job to respond to you. Um, and also, not only is it their job, but if they're not interested in your proposal, they don't want to see it. They don't want to have to process it because it's just more work for them that they know they're not going to fund. Um, so that's the that's the best way to do it, and it's the easiest way to to start to build a relationship with them. Uh, don't ever cold call. Don't ever just pick up the phone and call a program officer without first emailing them and, and asking to set up a time, um, or giving them a something to look at ahead of time. They are very very busy people, um, and I have heard almost across the board that that is not, that is frowned upon. Um, other ways that you can do that, you can build that relationship too, is the same way you build a relationship with any mentor. Um, they go to the same conferences that you do. They read the same journal articles that you do. Um, 
you know, heck, they're probably following the same social media accounts as you. All those different ways are, are ways to start to get to know them and to start to, more importantly, make sure that they recognize your name and recognize the work that you do. That's really the key point you're trying to get out of this. Okay. And Mike, that's, um, that's super important, Amanda. I wanted to add to that quickly because we had a student, a PhD student over in um, urban and um, uh, over in social sciences, mm -hmm. um, apply for the, uh, Mike, you know who this is probably, the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy. Oh, yeah. Um, and so there was a fellowship that she wanted to apply for as an extension to that. Um, and she ended up getting in contact with a program coordinator a project coordinator, and that person was able to help her navigate putting together a proposal that was more specific to the areas that that funding agency was interested in. What she was proposing, the person basically said, they're not interested in funding that. However, you have some parts of this proposal that, that we're interested in, and facilitating putting that together in a way that it would be of interest to the reviewers. So having those conversations and building those relationships are super important. But I do want to mention this. Not all programs are going to have a, 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 a project or a program coordinator. They may have people that can answer your questions. But I just want you to be mindful of that because sometimes people have a one-size-fits-all approach or idea of thinking. And so they think if I have a person in this agency, then everybody should mm -hmm to do this with me from every agency. But it is super important, as Mike mentioned, to develop those relationships if you can, because they will open up doors and give you insight into what those agencies are, are looking for. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, I mean, that, that that is a great point that not every agency is going to have something like this, have a program officer. And also, not every agency is going to have a program officer that you can talk to. Um, so I'll just give you my own personal example there is that I was funded by the Department of Energy. And if you go to DOE and you try to ask them a question like this during the proposal process, they won't respond to you because their agency regulations say that they can't. Um, now, what you can do is you can talk to them not during a proposal process. So you can send them something when there is not an RFP currently open and just say, this is the kind of stuff that I would like to do. Would you all be interested in this work and not tied to not don't say, would you fund this? Just would you be interested in this? And I think I just want to be make sure I, I do answer, Amanda, your specific question. I think that the best way to open the conversation with a program officer is to write that summary of your work and email it to them and ask, um, would you be interested? Would your program be interested in this kind of work? And is there anything that you can, any advice that you can give me? Okay. Thank you so I've, much. Absolutely. So I, on that same front, though, I would also add that while you are a graduate student, I would clearly identify yourself as a graduate student. Um, they're likely to be much more sympathetic to you okay. while you're a graduate student. Um, and you may get more information than you would um, if they think that you're a, a, a professor or a full PI or something like that. Does this, does this process, sorry, um, it might not be as related, but does this process, this process is the same if you are doing um, or trying to get funded for creative research? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this applies across the board. Um, creative research, uh, you know, hard science research, social science research, this, uh, this even applies outside the research field, right? If you're going to if you go on and you work for a nonprofit and it's a service delivery nonprofit um, and you want to connect with someone to ask, would you all be interested in this public education, public awareness program that we're going to put out? It's, it's the same process. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So, I wanted to address a couple of things that um, have been sent to me uh, privately as questions in general about um, identifying and applying for fellowships and awards. So I'm going to address a couple of those quickly, Mike, and then of sure. course, if we have a few more minutes, we can still con continue to answer questions. Um, so uh, one of the questions that I received is regarding the link or uh, a recording of this session. Um, so we did record the session, but we will have to edit um, the recording. 
And so once we edit the recording, uh, the video can be found on the OGFA webpage. So that's OGFA.FSU.edu. And I am also going to send a link to the video once it's edited to all of the participants. So I'll make sure that you all have a, a, a uh, link to the recording. Um, the other thing is, um, one of the things that Mike and I have talked about in the past and then briefly touched on recently is facilitating uh, more workshops where we can do some, um, engage some of the writing that supports the, the introduction to proposal writing um, that Mike did today. So he introduced all of the things that you need to consider when you're starting to pull together um, the things that the, the, the opportunities that you want to apply for. And he gave you examples of what those things look like. We're thinking about writing retreats and other types of writing workshops uh, later in the year where you can actually bring your work and you will have facilitated support to work through um, the revisions um, and crafting and drafting uh, the content. So I just want you to keep that in mind. The other thing is um, Mike mentioned exploring a list of past awardees for various awards. Um, so the Office of Graduate Fellowships and Awards has a database that is going live in about three to four weeks that has a list of awardees and awards that they've won for FSU students dating back to 2011. So I'm going to share my screen really, really quickly um, because this is not live. So it's not anything that you all can pull up. Are you all able to see a database on the screen? Yes. Okay, you see Student Success Database? Yes. Okay, so this is the database. Right now, this is a list of the students who received awards in 2019 and the awards that they received, their name, the award, the college, the department, all of those things. There's a drop down where this can be changed for any particular year. And so now you see 2011 and all of the awards. I show you that so that you, you know that in, in about four weeks, we're going to um, make this database live and so you can apply this to exactly what Mike said, connecting with recipients of awards um, so that you can learn about their backgrounds and some of the other things um, that were important to them putting together competitive and successful applications. Um, and then I think the last thing that I have here, um, I believe someone asked about scheduling a meeting with the author. Um, so if you go to the agfa.fsu.edu webpage, in the top right-hand corner, there's a Let's Meet tab. Um, you can uh, submit uh, a request to schedule a meeting. Keep in mind that there are 8,000 of you and there's one of me. Um, so it may take me a little while to get back to you to schedule a meeting, but be very specific about what your interest is in scheduling a meeting. So if you're at the very beginning stages of identifying awards, you're going to be in a small group meeting um, where we navigate databases um, for you to do exactly what Mike said, which was identify awards by fit. So we'll be in a meeting to do that. And then from there, you can schedule individual meetings for, um, for a specific follow-up. But those are the things that I wanted to mention um, that were generally coming to me through my, my private messages. We only, we're at 1130, but we do have maybe one or two minutes left. So if you all have questions, uh, don't be shy. Uh, feel free to ask those questions before we close out. Did you have a question, Amanda? I do have another question. I was giving That's them. fine. If anyone else had another question. Um, so I know that database will be live in four weeks, but if we wanted to uh, start on the capture planning phase, do you think we could perhaps email you uh, for some details specific to the department um, that those applicants were applying from? So that I wouldn't be able to provide you only because I've been working on this for two and a half years. So this is not 
it's been a long time in the making to pull all of this information together from 2011 to 2020. Um, the reason why I wouldn't be able to, if I, if I say yes, then I'm going to have tons of emails where I'm providing <laughs> specific information to college and departments or individuals who've won particular awards. Um, so what I would say is that if you schedule um, a meeting and as a follow-up to that meeting, there are particular awards you're interested in applying for, and then we can make that connection. Um, but um, I wouldn't say that because that's going to be tons of emails that I would have to. Yeah. Amanda, you and I are working together already. Um, so if there are particular awards that you have an interest in identifying previous recipients for, just let me know. Okay. I will announce when the database goes live. I will probably send something out via Canvas, very similar to the announcement for this uh, workshop. So um, that will be a widely shared um, announcement. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll just add on, on capture planning there. Um, that's something that I really, I really do think is very much an individual process. So uh -huh. um, it's, it's really about understanding first, okay, so I want to go to, let's just use NSF as an example. Um, or, or Amanda, I'm sorry, what's, what's your background? Uh, I'm currently a, a graduate student in the film school I'm focused on screenwriting. Okay, so let's not do NSF. Um, <laughs> let's do the National Endowment for Humanities. So if you know that you want to, you're interested in getting funding from NEH, um, and you want to understand more about how your work might connect to what they do, the very first thing I would do is just go to NEH's website and start looking around. Like, what, what do they identify on there as their priorities? Every, every organization that has a funding mission has a page on their website dedicated to funding. And it will tell you everything you need to know up front about what kind of projects they fund, what kind of um, costs are eligible, so what can you spend their money on, um, what are the, the usual deadlines for their programs, uh, proposal requirements, all of those things, that's the first step. The second step then is trying to go a bit deeper and connecting your specific ideas to NEH's ideas. So for that, you want to look at, on, and on that same website, their About Us section that talks about what their background is, what uh, what is their philosophy? What are their program priorities? Um, look at specifically, if you can, anytime they have, and this is across the board, if, if an organization ever has a strategic plan, always look at their strategic plan and see the kinds of things that they say in there that they want to do. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not super familiar with NEH, but to use my NSF example, NSF has a document out there that's called 10 Big Ideas for uh, the Next 10 Years. So if you can go, if NEH has a similar thing where it's like strategic priorities, 2020 to 2030 or whatever it is, if you go look at that and say, okay, well, my, my work would tie directly into big idea number three, navigating the new, uh, navigating the new Arctic. That's what NSF is. If you're doing work in the Arctic and you see the NSF is particularly interested in navigating the new Arctic, you might want to start thinking about how can you connect your very specific ideas to that broader goal that the agency is, is asking for. And then this becomes even more important for places like, like NEH and NEA in particular, and then also private foundations, because those two agencies are always under the um, – they're always under a microscope with Congress. And so you need to go and think about not just how, not just how do your ideas match up with what NEH is doing, uh, but how do your ideas match up with what NEH um, is always defending themselves against with Congress? How, so how can your ideas help certain Congress members who may be interested in that particular agency? And the only way to find that out is to really start, and this is, you can do all of this, but at this point, we are getting a little bit specific and a bit into the weeds for how to how to really go into it. But you can start looking at things like the last time the NEA director went before the House Appropriations Committee and talked about what their priorities were. Uh, news articles that talk about proposed funding cuts to NEA or something like that. 
uh, a particular congressman who is really interested in the arts, who has said something about a project that or a, uh, an area of art research or, or film um, that they would like to see funded. So you can really, really get into the weeds and look at look at this from every different possible angle. Um, and at that point, you may you may be going a bit overkill for a like a graduate fellowship type award. Um, but it certainly couldn't hurt, and it could certainly it could help. Um, you could end up being a really competitive proposal because you have been really, really, really responsive to what the agency wants, even more than what they requested in their request for proposals, because you went behind the scenes and understood why the things in the RFP were in the RFP. So you understand the underlying concerns of the agency. Right. Okay. That's super so, important. Mike. Okay, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just going to give an example of a time that I've done that. So one of the projects that I worked on was um, my favorite project ever was a program that was trying to get farmers to adopt renewable energy technologies. The program was called the Farm Renewable Energy Demonstration Program or the FRED program. Um, and it was funded by the USDA. And one of the things that I did in researching how to get, like how to try to get USDA to fund my program was looking at why were they issuing that request for proposals in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it led me to look, like I was saying, they're all the way back into their appropriations process to figure out exactly who was it who was lobbying for that program to get created within USDA five years ago in order to get that RFP released today that I was applying for. And what I ended up finding was that the the particular entity that was really pushing for that program was called the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, uh, which is a, a DC think tank. And they had done a report five years prior about energy efficiency opportunities in, um, in the agricultural sector. And so what I did was cite that report wow. in my proposal, was go back and say, and, and USDA never said anything about this. This was all because I had done the background research into it. But I went back and said, all right, well, this is, the, this is the report. This is the white paper that inspired this program in the first place. Here's how my proposed project fits in with the goals and is inspired by that white paper, incorporates it into what you, USDA, are asking for out of your RFP. Um, and here's what I want to do. And that got cited in the reviewer comments back to me, that it was the only proposal that had actually gone back and looked at the original source material for why the program existed. Um, and I was told that it, it was one of the most important things that differentiated my proposal from the others. That's awesome. Yeah. Super important. Well, thank you, Mike. As we close out, one of the things that I want to leave you with is, as Mike mentioned, the process of identifying um, funding mechanisms that are a good fit for you is an individual one. So that is not something that you have to wait to do. Um, if you want guidance with that process, my office can provide guidance, but that's something that you can jumpstart on your own, right? Really consider your areas of interest, uh, personal, professional, academic, um, and start exploring and researching those opportunities. Keep in mind that just because you are eligible for an opportunity does not make it a good fit. Mm -hmm. Okay, So the mission and vision of that opportunity align with your interests is where you start to put together whether it's a good fit for you. And so for those that email me and say, can you tell me what awards are a good fit for me? Typically I can't because there are hundreds of thousands of awards out there. And so that is that individual process that Mike is talking about where you start to explore and do your own research. So I just wanna give you that heads up because I know I'm gonna get tons of emails uh, regarding helping to identify awards. But if you take that first step, to really kind of think about your interests, both academic, personal, and professional. Look at the mission and vision of the award that you're uh, thinking about applying for for fit, and then start digging, right? That's that part where Mike says to do the research and looking at all of the moving pieces of the request for proposal and all of those things. Keep those things in mind as you start to look for opportunities and then be very strategic about what opportunities you pursue, right? so that you are keeping in mind time management, a reasonable timeline, 
um, and all of the other things that need to be considered for moving that process along. Um, but I do wanna thank you again for, uh, for joining us, for sticking around. We will provide a copy of the video for this workshop once we've edited it. Um, but before that, I will send everyone the PowerPoint, right? Because everybody's looking for the information. So I will provide you with the, the PowerPoint if Mike is amenable to that. Um, and then um, once we have the video edited, I will post the, the video on Aqua's webpage and provide you with um, a link. But thank you again for joining us and I hope you all have a good rest of the week.